of you who are joining us uh, online as well. Uh, hope you've had a good day. And uh, we are going to spend the next few moments together in God's Word. We carry on our study of um, God's attributes tonight. We just have an ultimate um, session. So um, t- tonight we're looking at the the doctrine of God's uh, power, omnipotence, uh, that God is the almighty God. Uh, and before we think through that subject together, I'm going to read uh, from the psalm, Psalm 104, and a, a passage, a psalm that uh, yeah, declares, this, uh, declares this truth about the living God, that he is almighty. Psalm 104. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty, covering yourself with light as with a garment, stretching out the heavens like a tent. He lays the beams of his chambers on the waters. He makes the clouds his chariot. He rides on the wings of the wind. He makes his messengers winds, his ministers a flaming fire. He set the earth on its foundations so that it should never be moved. You covered it with the deep as with a garment. The water stood above the mountains. At your rebuke they fled. At the sound of your thunder they took to flight. The mountains rose, the valleys sank down to the place that you appointed for them. You set a boundary that they may not pass so that they might not again cover the earth. You make springs gush forth in the valleys. They flow beneath between the hills. They give drink to every beast of the field, the wild donkey. Donkeys quench their thirst. Beside them, the birds of the heavens dwell. They sing among the branches. From your lofty abode, you water the mountains. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of your work. You cause the grass to grow for the livestock and plants for man to cultivate, that he may bring forth food from the earth and wine to gladden the heart of man, oil to make his face shine and bread to strengthen man's heart. The trees of the Lord are watered abundantly, the cedars of Lebanon that he planted. In them the birds build their nests. The stork has her home in the fir trees. The high mountains are for the wild goats. The rocks are a refuge for the rock badgers. He made the moon to mark the seasons. The sun knows its time for setting. You make darkness and it is night. When all the beasts of the forest creep about, the young lions roar for their prey, seeking their food from God. When the sun rises, they steal away and lie down in their dens. Man goes out to his work and to his labor until the evening. O Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom have you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Here is the sea, great and wide, which teems with creatures innumerable, living things both small and great. There go the ships and Leviathan, which you formed to play in it. These all look to you to give them their food in due season. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are filled with good things. When you hide your face, they are dismayed. When you take away their breath, they die and return to their dust. When you send forth your spirit, they are created and you renew the face of the ground. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works, who looks on the earth and it trembles who touches the mountains and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have being. May my meditation be pleasing to him, for I rejoice in the Lord. Let sinners be consumed from the earth and let the wicked be no more. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord. Amen. Let me say a short word of prayer before we continue our study tonight. Let us pray. Our oh, gracious God and Father, we thank you for your presence with us uh, and uh, your power that tonight 
sustains us as we sit together to um, to to study your word as we uh, draw near to you, Lord, in 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 longing for uh, your your truth and longing for knowledge of you. We thank you for the grace that we have received in our hearts, so that there is a desire to learn the word of God, to know who God is, to be shaped and transformed by the purity and the power of God's word and God's voice. Bless us tonight, we pray. Uh, help us to see you, Lord, how we need you, how our hearts, our souls, our minds need to be fed with uh, the knowledge of God in Jesus Christ. So fill us with that truth um, and help me. We go, may our faith be strengthened. May we go from, from grace to grace um, as, we, uh, as, we, as we study God's word tonight, as we hear God tonight. So be with us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so tonight we are looking at the, uh, the doctrine of God's power. God is the almighty God. So, um, see, I, th- I imagine that on your screens you have, uh, you have the order in which we're going to do things. So, we'll first start with looking at the, uh, the text, certain texts that speak of God's uh, omnipotence and God being the almighty, uh, then looking at uh, the correlation between the doctrine of God's power and, and how the Bible from there um, relates to other attributes of God, uh, sovereignty, majesty, glory. Um, what the Bible says about God being able to do everything, but also uh, curiously, some things being impossible for him to do, and what that means for the doctrine of, of omnipotence. A word on how God does, d- d- delights in showing his power through weakness, and then some applications. How, how does an understanding of this doctrine of God's uh, power, how, how should it, in what ways should it be a support for uh, Christians? In what ways should it um, strengthen us in what ways has it been the ground of the confidence of God's people if you heard me reading the 104th psalm just now you would have seen how after a declaration ultimately if you want of God's power the psalmist closes by speaking of you know him responding in praise and thanksgiving uh, and that's essentially what this study of the attributes of God should be doing to us it should be it should be awakening faith. It should be uh, causing us to rejoice and delight in the Lord because we, we, we we're learning more of who he is. So uh, a greater, a clearer understanding of, of who God is, is the foundation, should be the foundation of increased faith. So, yeah, we look at that. Now, very often, the we, we speak about God's power, the word that's often used I think it's a common word, even though it's not an English word. It, it's like an, it is an English word, I guess. It clearly has uh, Latinized roots. Is omnipotent. We call God omni, omnipotent. He's the omnipotent God. Right? It's a word that means that God, the word literally means all power, right? Omni is all potent, is, is power, and God is all powerful. And as a summary of, um, as a summary of, of, of the Bible's teaching on God's power, this attribute of God's power, calling God omnipotent is declaring that, one, you know, God is able to do all the things that he pleases, that he desires to do. He can do everything that he will, so he's all-powerful. Um, there's no other creature or being like that in the world who whatever they desire or set their minds to do, they can accomplish, but God is. God has no limitations. God has no restrictions. There's no hindrances. There's no want or weakness. He can do everything that he wants to do, and we should say he does all that he wants to do, Um, but it's also a secondary thing. So it's primarily, when we say God is all-powerful, we are saying that God has all power in himself, right? In in and of himself, he's, yeah, he he has no limitations, Um, 
But we're also making a secondary point that outside of God, every display of power finds its source in him. God is the source of every display of power that there has ever been, right? Anything that requires energy, activity, God is the cause. He's the actual cause. We, he's the source of all power, ultimately. Um, in, in, whatever way, in, in whatever way we describe that power or wherever that power is contained, God is ultimately its source, um, whether it's the movement of the body and muscle power and, and so on, or it's what we would think is some sort of artificial power, um, or it's the, yeah, the power of the elements of, of the world, the power of electricity or whatever. God is the source of every power. He, he creates, and the Bible, yeah, the Bible paints it in two different ways. He not, he not just creates, he also sustains. So it's not like God gives, makes a person and gives that person then, so God gives someone power, yes, you know, um, say an, something that looks powerful when a man or woman does, yeah, maybe af, an athlete, you know, an athlete runs 100 meters and God gives the person the power for, for, the, to, for them to, to move with the speed and the strength that they do is a gift. We say that. But even when that person is running the 100 meter race, we're saying, apart from God sustaining that power then, God, it's not like that person becomes autonomous. And that power becomes their own and they can withhold it from God and do it. No, God still is the one that has to sustain even the use of it then. Everything, everything comes through from him. He's the source of all power. And so we say God is, that's why we call God the all-powerful one. Um, in a true sense, God is, is power. He's, he's powerful. And the Bible teaches that over and over again. The Bible, I think, paints this sustained picture of God's omnipotence. And the, um, the, the particular ways in which God displays it uh, and in which, for which reason believers have found uh, uh, reason to cause to rejoice and to have faith. And so, yeah, we're going to do that. This is the most important thing is always to establish this from the scriptures. And so we have a lot of Bible reading to do. Um, so firstly, just these group of texts that testify to this. There are, as I said, hundreds of these easily in the, in the scriptures. So we can only pick a handful, but um, you, get, you get the sense. Um, let, me get, let me ask some of you to do some reading. I'll, I'm going to read the first, Genesis 17, verse 1. Uh, you know, I'm so blind. Is that at the way or the way at the back? Uh, Evelyn, since your mouth is so big, Revelations 19, verse 6, please. And I just want the two people beside Evan. I can see, this is so bad, I can see Aaron. Is that Abigail over there? By the way, if you're watching from home, it's because there's something blocking me. It's not that I can't see them. Okay. Uh, Wendy, Psalm 24, verse 8, please. Uh, where's Aaron? Aaron, please. Job 36, verse 5. Let me get my favorite fifth air to read. Uh, Psalm 62, verse 11. Um, Abby. Someone said Abby, sir? Abby, don't hide from me. Where is she? Oh. Abby, can you please read? Revelations 4, verse 11. Presh, if you please read. Revelations 4, 11. Uh, Presh, could you please read. Um, Ephesians, Ephesians 3, 19 to 20. Um, Mags, could you please read. Isaiah 43, 11 to 13. Amanda, please read. Genesis 18, 14. Uh, Malik, please. Matthew 3, 9. Nicole, should I leave you? Can you read? Oh. Matthew 19, 26. And we'll end with Nathaniel on Luke 1, 37. Almost everyone has a passage to read, isn't it? 
Mary's, Mary has been, Mary's busy. Um, so who's reading Genesis 17, 1? That's me. And some, someone's reading, um, did I also want to read Revelation 19, 6? Okay. So everyone, just read that after me, please. So Genesis 17, 1. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to, nope, 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 nope. Forgive. Genesis 17. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. Uh, Evelyn, please, Revelation 19, 6. <laughs> then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a, mul a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty pearls of thunder crying out, hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. So you have a good picture of, I mean, the beginning and the end of the Bible, and God is, I mean, of course, right through the Bible, what he's referred to as Almighty. Now, uh, Genesis 17.1 is an example of a, 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 a term that is applied to God quite frequently, at least in the Pentateuch, in the first five books of the Bible, um, a Hebrew term, El Shaddai, which kind of mean, yeah, means he's, he's almighty and it was the ground of God um, assuring the patriarchs that he could accomplish his promises. He was able to fulfill his covenant. God is the almighty one. You no, know, I, I guess that, that phrase gets us close to stay, stating the fact that God is just omnipotent. So we worship the almighty uh, again, God is stressed to be mighty, the mighty God. Who's reading Psalm 24, 8 for me, please? Who is the king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Thank you. Job 36, verse 5. Did I ask someone to read that? Behold, God is mighty and does not despise any. He is mighty in strength of understanding. Yeah, so again, similar phrase. The Bible refers to God as mighty, as mighty. It seems to be that very often when, the, when, when, when God is being called mighty, as opposed to just simply stating about how God has all power, um, that very often the language of God being mighty is, is related to him being mighty to, to do what he des determines, uh, desires to do. So it's, it's God in action almost. Um, uh, who, you know, the king of glory, mighty in battle, uh, mighty to save, mighty to destroy. Uh, so when God, when God comes down uh, he, and, and he determines to do something, whether it's in judgment or in salvation, nothing stops him. He is mighty. He's a mighty God. Uh, and he's the God of power and strength. The God of power and strength. I asked someone to read Psalm 62 verse 11. Once God has spoken, twice have I heard this, that power belongs to God. Power belongs to God. He's the God of power. Revelations 4.11, right? I also want to read that, no? Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Um, yes. I should have asked someone to read Psalm 96. I'll do that myself. Um, Psalm 96, verse 7. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. This is, you know, so someone just read a passage. I think it was Abby. Um, worthy, uh, Lord is worthy to receive power. What does that mean? It's not, not that we, we can give God power. You know, we can't. When he says he's worthy to receive power, it's the saints ascribing, as the psalmist says. That means they're acknowledging that power comes from him. He, he's the one to whom all power belongs. So, so the point is that there are points in, imagine that there's, there's ways in which unbelieving humanity live that means that they go around thinking that they are, they're the ones who are the source of their own strength. That they're the ones who are doing it. That they're the ones... Um, this sense of self-sufficiency. But what worship is, 
I mean, for sinful man and woman, of course, worship is the, 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 the renewing of the mind that lets you realize, that, well, it's not me. It's someone else. It's he's worthy. So that's what worship is. Worship is acknowledging, right, God's worthiness. And, of course, in doing so, our own comparative nothingness, and, and, and the saints do that very often in the realm of power, because they come, when they come to the place of worship and they come to this conviction, this acknowledgement, this awareness, how foolish we've been to think that we're self-sufficient. How foolish I've been to think that I'm the one, um, I'm the source of all my accomplishments. I am the, the source of all my energy. No, we say, to God be the glory. To God be the power. He rece- uh, to God, worthy to receive the power. What does that mean? It means he's the, the source of all power. He's a source of all strength. Um, that's why um, that's why uh, Herod, I'm preaching, I'm preaching about that Sunday evening. Herod, the Bible said he was struck because he didn't give glory to God. He thought he was the one that had all the strength and all the power. His power is absolute. There's no limitations. Um, he, God does both what he wills and is able to accomplish more than he has willed, right? More than he has done. He can do, God could make 55 worlds like this easily without exerting, you know, without exerting too much strength or being tired. No such thing. Um, his power is absolute, no, knows no bounds. Uh, I asked someone to read Isaiah 43, 11 to 13. Who, who did I ask to read it? So, so um, Mike, what version are you reading there? Uh, okay. You're just reading it like a KGVI. Um, Vanessa, do your job, please. Ephesians 3. Who's reading Ephesians 3 for me? And to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us. Yes, that's a passage we read when we're closing on, on Sunday evening. Um, able to do far more than we ask or think. His power knows no limitations. You can't even, uh, yeah, his, God's power is absolute. Th- this is helpful to think of in, re- in relation to Satan especially, to realize what the relationship between God and Satan is. Satan, God is omnipotent, so before God, Satan is, is, is not powerful, is nothing. You know, in a strange way, in a strange consistency, curious one, but it's true, God is the source of Satan's power. And so when God wants, he can take that power of Satan. Um, this is not two equals. It's not uh, good versus evil fighting. Uh, it's not like those, it's just a Marvel movie and you have the villain and he's fighting. No, like Satan is not an equal to God. He's not trouble for God. Satan's trouble for us. And um, God, God, is, God is demonstrating his power by having mortals, by, having, by, by giving mortal men victory over that, that angelic being. Uh, but God's power is absolute. And nothing is too hard for him, right? Two, we're reading now two almost uh, favorite uh, phrases of the, of the Bible. Just, they're rhetorical questions very often, and they're just really calling us to just realize how boundless God's power is. Nothing is too hard for him. Genesis 18.14. Yes, is anything too is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you. About this time next year, and Sarah shall have a son. Right, that was in, in response to uh, Sarah's unbelief. Why did you, why are you disbelieving, Sarah? Is, is anything too hard? Nothing's too difficult for him. There's nothing. Everything is easy for for, for God to do. Um, big things, small things, all things are are easy for God. Nothing's too hard. And then um, these, these uh, series of verses in the Bible that say that 
all things are possible. All things are possible for God. Again, another way that the Bible testifies to God's... Who's reading Matthew 3 to verse 9? Who's reading Matthew 3 verse 9? Okay, when I say ready? Matthew 3 verse 9, please. And do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. All right, God can raise up children from stones. So, so even the things that God, uh, he doesn't do, God doesn't make people from stones. If he wanted to, he could. All things are possible for him. There's nothing like impossibility with God, which is an important thing to, it's an interesting thing to hold in, in, in tension with, as I say, statements that we'll look at later where there are things that are spoken of as impossibility. But whatever that means, it doesn't mean that the Bible is claiming a limitation on God's strength. As far as his power is concerned, there's no limitation. Um, it's 19.26. Someone read Matthew 9.26. Did I ask for that? But Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. With God all things are possible. With God all things are possible. And uh, lastly, Luke. Is it 137? For nothing will be impossible with God. <laughs> Absolutely, nothing is impossible with God. Um, so, so that's the Bible's clear, um, unequivocal, without, without any kind of hesitation, without any um, stuttering, like the Bible's clear. God is just absolutely powerful. Absolute power belongs to God. Okay, we're going to do some more reading. You can't, we can't read too much, uh, too much Bible. And um, the next set of texts is how the Bible testifies to uh, God's, uh, how, how God's, the unique ways in which God's power is put forth. So, so there are aspects of how God relates to his world. So the, the absolutely uh, almighty God, God was almighty before he ever created anything, before he ever interacted with, 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 with his creation. But there are ways in which God has interacted with his creation that the Bible emphasizes as, as being bearing witness to the almighty power that God possesses. Um, so, uh, wait, um, Mary, how much of that have you put on yet? I can't see on there. You're too, you're too fast is your point, is your, is your problem. Take it off. Quickly, quickly. All right, so I know you, I imagine some of you have already stolen the answers, but I'll ask you anyway. In, in what ways do you think that the Bible, okay, let's do it like this. You tell me the ways that you think the Bible, areas that you think the Bible testifies to God's power, um, and tell me with, maybe tell me with a Bible passage that comes to mind. Ma Margaret, please. Creation, because the heavens declare the glory of God. <laughs> That's a very powerful answer, Max. Thank you. Yes, creation is one of those ways. The Bible testifies that God is, is powerful. And so very often when the Bible's talking about God and creation, one of the things it's saying about God is he's powerful. Anyone else? Something you can think of with the Bible, ways in which the Bible testifies to God's power, you know, the things that God does in life, God does with his creation, God does in, uh, in, uh, when he reveals himself to his world, that is a is testimony to how powerful God is. I, I, need, I need at least two more answers, but I'll take three. Amanda, please. Um, the resurrection mm. and the verse, he's risen. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And you know, it's interesting because it's, it's actually an emphatic kind of statement in the, in the New Testament. So, something like this, like, Okay, you've seen God is God is all powerful, and you've seen Him display His power in so many ways throughout the Scriptures. Like in so many ways, God has displayed His power, but you've never seen God put forth His power the way He put it, put forth the power His power in raising His Son from the dead. That's where you see God. Not I'm not, not not that the resurrection exhausts the power of God. The point is, as far as God revealing His power to created beings to this world, that's where God is. If you want. That's where God has displayed. Let, let us see it in his, in his highest glories, highest form, 
raising his son from the dead. So the resurrection. And I'll say something about that shortly as to why the Bible can speak in that way. Uh, Because it's not simply the matter of raising the son from the dead. It's because in, because obviously people have been raised from the dead. God has shown his power in raising people from the dead before, right? There's there's people raised from the dead in the Old Testament. Um, Who raised someone from the dead in the Old Testament? Anyone know who raised someone from the dead in the Old Testament? There's two people at least I can think of. Speak out loud, say out. Elijah. Elijah is Elijah. Okay, that's what someone said. And there's someone, another person as well. HRC. This is on live stream. We have to show that we know the Bible here. Elijah is one. The other is same letter. Starts with the same letter. Huh? Elisha, Elijah and Elisha, both raise um, people from the dead. So, um, yeah, so that happened in the Old Testament. But in the, in the, in, in the, in the, in the raising of the dead of Jesus Christ, and, and Lazarus was raised from the dead, and, you know, Christ, according to the Gospels, raised quite a few people from the dead. But the point about Christ being raised from the dead is, in him being raised from the dead, he never died again because he defeated death. And so the destruction of death is where God puts forth you know, we're seeing the power of God. Um, I'm, I'm saying, I'm doing this now anyway. Listen, all the power that this world has ever experienced, all the man-made power, whether it's in technology, in, mili- in military forces, uh, all the weightlifters and powerful men in the history of the world, all of them put together cannot defeat death. But the Son of God has done so in the cross. And that's where God has put forth almighty power in the resurrection of the dead. Um, let me not. Let me go through the rest. Um, so yeah, let's let's read. I want I want you guys to read. I want us to read the Bible. So uh, let me get start from Nate this time. Nate to read Romans one verse twenty, please. Um, I'll read a passage, and I I read the passages in Isaiah, a passage from Isaiah actually. So Nate will read Romans 1.20, please. Um, Amanda, if you please read Acts 17.28. And Malik, Hebrews 1, verse 3. I'm going to read it. I'll read the Exodus passage. Mags, please read um, 1 Peter 1.5. Um, and fifth, uh, Deuteronomy 26, verse 8. Presh, please. Um, 1 Corinthians 15, 24 to 26. And 54 to 57. And Nicole, Romans 16, 20. Uh, Wendy, Romans 1, verse 4. Evelyn, Ephesians 1, 19 to 20, Aaron, Philippians 3, 20 to 21, Dami, 2 Peter 1, verse 3. Dami's there, right? Okay. Yeah. So let's start with Romans 1, 20, please. Attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. All right, so there in creation, um, Paul says God's power is displayed in creation. I'll move on quick. I've said a lot about that. But the point is, when the Bible speaks about creation and when we think about creation, we have to be very careful. When we think about creation, we have to be thinking about the God who is the power, but it's God's power being displayed. It's God who sustains it. Um, Acts 17:28. Amanda. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed, indeed his offspring. In him we live, move, and have our being. It's an amazing passage about how God sustains the entire universe, how God sustains. In him we have our existence. It doesn't matter if you're Christian or not Christian, God is sustaining everything at this very hour. It's God's power. Um, Hebrews 1 verse 3. 
He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he, uplo- and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Mm. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So Jesus Christ, Jesus who upholds this universe um, at all points, at all times, in all seasons, regardless of what's happening and what the culture is, Jesus Christ is actually the one who gives people the energy. This is why uh, the day of judgment is going to be so great and is so daunting and so fearsome because then we have to get, we, we, we realize just how much we have been depending on God, on his, his resources, and just so, so how much we owe and how much, because of how much we've abused. Um, we sing a hymn sometimes that says, you know, not till then, that is not till we get to glory, we'll realize just how much we owe. We owe so much. Um, so God sustains the universe. And then the Bible speaks about how God puts forth his power often in defending his people. He defends and protects his people. Um, Deuteronomy 26, 8, that's fair, fair. And the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, with great deeds of terror, with signs and wonders. So right through the Old Testament, the people of Israel express over and over and over, that's, a, that's, a, that's in relation to the Exodus, which is like the prime example of how God puts forth his power to defend his people. Um, but over, yeah, right through the Old Testament, we, we get that testified. What God does, one of the things that God does with his power is he protects those who he calls his own. He, he keeps them. And, you know, First Peter 1 verse 5 to see one of those, uh, the, 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 the ultimate way in which God keeps his people. A New Testament testimony to that. Who's reading First Peter 1 verse 5? Who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So, so our perseverance as Christians, our making it to the end, is, is by God's power. God puts forth his power to keep us from the wiles of the enemy. And in defending his people, of course, that means God also has to destroy his enemies. And that's what God does with his power. Um, Romans 16, 20. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Thanks, Nicole. First Corinthians 15, 24 to 26 and 54 to 57. Precious one that has those big verses. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So very often God uses his power to destroy his people's enemies, uh, destroy his enemies and um, the great enemy that God will destroy for us and which God, wherein God will put forth his great power and we'll, we'll have to bear witness to him. We'll bear witness to him being almighty and we'll say he's worthy to receive all the power is death. Um, God will destroy death for his people um, and raise them to eternal uh, glory of his son. And that's the power of God. That's the omnipotent power. Our, our hope in, in that is a hope in the Almighty, Almighty God, uh, raising His Son from the dead. As I, as I was saying when uh, Sister Amanda brought that up, um, this, is, this is the the this is the, uh, the 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 highest point of God revealing His power. And the Bible speaks about it this way and bears witness to it this way. Is in is in the resurrection. Romans one, verse four, please. And declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. In Ephesians 1, 19 to 20. Ooh. 
And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his great might? Is that 19 to 20? Yes. Can you read it again, please? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his great might? So in the resurrection of the Son, in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, God puts forth his power. It's the power of God that raised the son from the grave. You know, according to the New Testament, that's both the power of the son himself being the eternal, omnipotent, um, immortal God who could not die. He is able to raise himself as in, as according to his sinful nature. Um, sorry, according to his human nature, forgive me, his bodily nature. He was able to raise his body, his, his human nature. Um, the Spirit is often spoken as the Spirit who raised the Son and the Father as well. Um, so God puts forth his power in raising his Son. But as I said, the, the, mighty, the, the mighty thing about that is in the way the, 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 the Son is united. Because why would God have to take on human form and be subject to, and, 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 and the human nature of Christ be subject to death? Is because he is representing um, his people. It's because Christ is in union with sinful man and woman, right? He's, he's united to them. He's united to save them. And he destroys death on their behalf as he takes it upon himself. And it's in the destruction of death that God destroys the judgment of death that he himself had placed because men and women have sinned against him. That The Bible says we are witnessing the greatest display of God's power. And it's worth saying about re re resurrection power as well. That it doesn't simply apply to the final act of resurrection that the Bible promises all of us, or as though resurrection is just simply in the bodily uh, change that we all experience. Resurrection life begins the moment we receive Jesus. Right? The Bible says anyone who believes in Jesus Christ receives eternal life. And so in the in the day-to-day -day experience of the power of the Spirit, in the overcoming of sin and sinful desires, we are witnessing... Um, we are witnessing the power of God. I've just seen that Joyce is somewhere hiding behind a pillar there. And so she missed all the reading. I can't believe this. Um, who's reading Philippians 3, 20 to 21, please? But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Um, yes. So, the, when I say regeneration there, I'm referring also to, the, ultimately to the fact that God is going to make a new creation out of us. So God puts his power in what is the fruit of the resurrection. So Jesus Christ's resurrection is the is the first fruit, right, of not just our bodily resurrection. So Jesus Christ's physical resurrection is not simply the promise that... We, it's not, Jesus Christ's resurrection is not simply the promise that you and I will experience physical resurrection. It's also the promise that the whole world, in a sense, will experience a resurrection. There'll be what we call the new creation. It'll be created anew. And so God puts forth his power, and we'll... I, I guess if there's any realm that requires the future display of, um, that requires us to testify to a future point of God's display of power, you know, a point that we have not seen yet, it's the new creation. You know, we haven't seen, that's what, that's what the Bible says, our eyes have not seen, we haven't seen, you know, what God has planned for his creation. That's when we will really see um, the, some, you know, the fullness of God's power, what it means that God is powerful. It's in the... Um, when God makes a new heaven and a new earth, right? And, and when, we see the, when we see how God in his power um, fixes everything, removes sin, gives us eternal life, that's when we'll really be seeing. And that's why Revelations is, the song is, is worthy to receive power. And, the, you know, the, the saints who, Revelation, the book of Revelation is speaking prophetically to what it, what it is to be convinced, to be aware that God will one day make all things new, or that God is making all things new. So, you know, we never get close to being as 
in awe of God's power as we will one day be when we stand before his presence. I just realized, I, I didn't pull up one more. Um, I won't read the passages either, but the, the last bullet point would have been on government and to say that basically the Bible also says that God displays his power through derived, um, delegated uh, delegated uh, power, right? So there are, there are those who God invests his power in, like government, um, and, and they, they rule, in a sense, in, in the stead of, of God on God's behalf in the world, you know, and uh, God displays his power through that as well, through government in the world. Anyway, so those are the, um, the, the areas that the Bible speaks about, um, God displaying his power, and the Bible calls us to observe this and to meditate on this, to learn that our God is powerful. Now quickly, uh, just to make a point, and this, this comes out very often in the, in the Psalms, um, it comes out very often in the, in, 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 yeah, in the way the people of God praise God for his power. It's a close correlation between God's power and some other truths that the Bible tells us about who God is, one being his sovereignty. Because God is all-powerful, he's in control of everything. He's sovereign over everything um, because he has all power. Um, because he's sovereign, it it's also bears witness to the fact that he is in control over everything. So God's power uh, is very, it's, 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 yeah, it's impossible actually to separate both ideas. We might identify specific or, or de- identify particulars about them, but you can't separate them. Any of these three ideas, God's power, when you speak of God's power, one of the things you're speaking of is the sovereign God. And, and if in any um, conversation or in, if in any explaining of God's power, we deny sovereignty, we are denying aspects of God's power. And, and the best way I can think of, maybe somewhat provocative, is to think about how we do this in the area of salvation. When people say, for example, that salvation boils down to someone's free will, so that what ultimately separates a person from another, as far as a matter of salvation or conversion is concerned, is your free will, then you are denying something of God's sovereignty, because apparently there's an area in a person's life where God is not sovereign, which is the will. The suggestion that God could have left the free will, the will of a man to him, to his own self, or the will of a woman to her own self, so that she has perfect or he has perfect control over his will, and God cannot interfer, interfere in that, is a denial of God's sovereignty, and also a denial of God's omnipotence. God is sovereign over all things, regardless of how that might jar against our understanding, regardless of how that might give us food for thought or leave us confused. It is true; He's sovereign. If He's sovereign, there's nothing outside His control. Neither the men and women, neither those who make it to heaven or those who make it to hell. Nothing's outside of God's control. He's sovereign. And, you, and that applies to everything. It applies to life and death and sickness and riches and all of these things. God is sovereign over everything. The other idea that the Bible presents closely related to power, when the Bible speaks about God's power, it speaks about his majesty. The powerful God is the majestic God. The one who's in control is a God who must inspire fear. And so... You could say that one of the words that, that, is, that the Bible uses to testify to God's power is when the Bible calls him a king. When the Bible calls God king, which is language of majesty, it's saying he's powerful. He has all power. He's able to control. So, so majesty is, uh, is, is another idea, another truth that is closely related. So when we speak about God's power, we must, we, we must realize, if you start to meditate on God's power, if we start to seek God's power, we approach it, with, we approach it as we are approaching majesty. And there's a sense of fear. And so let me, let me again, anecdotally, it's, it's strange, and this happened, it used to happen in churches, that people would be laying claim to God's power, but in such, it's like pantomime, like they're, they're joking, like it's a joke, like they're, they're, they're careless about it. And you, and you know God is not there because if you really believe in God's power, you, you, will approach it, you will approach it with awe. You say there's majesty about it. So, for example, uh, you know, 
I, I don't know if he does this anymore, but you think of someone like Benny Hinn and associating God's power with this man, you know, throwing his jacket everywhere, spraying his hand. And it's just, it's just a joke. It's like, where, where, this is the king of glory. Um, no, no man should feel, uh, have, feel like they have the audacity to boast or show off or to, be, to have bravado when they're de- dealing with the power of God. We're all, we all humble before his majesty. And I, you know, I, 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 I grew up experiencing a point in my Christian life, you know, Christians where the power of God made them so boastful and powerful, and they walk around, and, you know, they call themselves men of God or whatever, and there was a, there was a, there was a, there was a, uh, there was a, there was a, a, a pride about them because apparently they had the power of God. But if you truly fear, if you, if you, when, you're, when you're brought before the power of God, you notice that there is a majesty, and it's not you, it's his. You, you bow before it, you're humble before it. And glory, again, the Bible often associates um, glory with God. Because God is all-powerful, he is truly glorious. He's glorious. He's worthy of being adored. Um, he's worthy of being studied. He's worthy of, worthy of infatuation. Uh, God is worthy of that because he's glorious. He draws, we're drawn to him. uh, One who truly sees him is drawn to him. Um, And uh, yeah, so those things uh, are are truths that the the Bible associates with the omnipotence of God. The omnipotent God is sovereign, he's majestic, he's glorious. Um, Yeah. But there's also, Mary, don't put this up. What's, what's on your screen? Did she put it up already? Oh, good. But there are also, interestingly enough, as we think about the power of God, the potential of God, the power of God, there are things that the Bible says God does not have the power to do, right? And the question we have to ask ourselves is how to balance that. So we, that's why you love those verses in the Bible that say, God, all things are possible for God. But there are multiple, at least, there are multiple verses in the Bible that speak about things not being possible for God. So, uh, who wants to tell? What, what things? What, what things do you think actually? It's a fair biblical. It's it's a it's accurate to say, and biblical to say, God cannot do. That's Aaron, I believe. I've I've got one. Go on, Mary. Go on, Mary. It's impossible for God to lie. Impossible for God to lie, um, and that's one of the most. You can put up the first uh, one, actually, Mary, because that's the first one. Just the first. It's impossible for God to lie, right? Over and over again, the Bible says that God cannot lie. The God who cannot lie. Uh, that's what it, it, Hebrews 6.18 actually says it is impossible for God to lie. So God cannot lie, absolutely. Um, Aaron, you had a different one, or was that the one you had? Uh, i got something else. Go it's impossible for him to change his mind. Yes. That's my next one. Are you sure, are you sure you're... That's the next one, so you can put that one. It's impossible for God to change. Numbers 3, 9, 23, 19 says something similar. God cannot change his mind. Yeah, he's, um, he's uh, immutable. He doesn't change. Um, he knows the end from the beginning. He's never caught unawares. Um, whatever he does, whatever changes you see God do are not changes in his mind or plans. These are the very ways he has, cho- he has chosen to fulfill um, his plans and purposes from eternity. It's impossible for God to change. That's another impossibility. Anything else? Uh, God can't die. Yes, that's a great one. Um, because God is the uh, immortal God. So yes, God cannot die. Which is interesting, right? In light of the uh, the fact that Jesus Christ died on the cross. That our hymn says, "Tis finished." No, not sorry. I, I was about to spread rumors. It's to finish that the Messiah dies. It's um, and can it be that says it's mis- tis mystery all the immortal dies. You know, and Wesley is right to say next in the next line, who can explore, which means who can explain this strange design? Like who can explain this? This is mind-boggling um, because ultimately we know that even though we believe, I'm happy to say that it was God on the cross, that's, that's, but I also have to say that God cannot die. Right? God cannot die, and yes, yet in a sense we, we say God died, but yet God cannot die. We have to, you know, it's a, um, it's a, it's a weird thing to, to try and, it's a strange thing to understand. Uh, but yes, God cannot die. Uh, like us, we die, but he's immortal. His years have no end, says the psalmist. Um, uh, uh, Nathaniel, you did say one? To tempt, and that's my next one, so maybe you can put that up. God cannot tempt. 
And that's what, what, what book, what, what, what passage are we going to to see that? I think there might be only one passage, so someone has to tell me. Yeah, James. James chapter. Oh, she's put up there. And some of you are saying it with so much confidence. Anyway, James 1, yes. Um, God doesn't tempt and can't be tempted. Sorry, that's even not even, yeah. It's impossible for God to tempt. I meant to say it's impossible for God to be tempted, right? Or to tempt others with evil, both those things, right? There's no iniquity, no sin in him. Uh, anyone, is there another one? Anyone know another one? Anyone want to suggest another one? It's, it's probably it's hard to get this one. Okay, God cannot grow weary, cannot grow tired, says Isaiah. He doesn't grow tired. He doesn't lose energy. Um, and lastly, Dami said, mentioned earlier, God is impossible for God to die. And so th- th- I guess the point to make is none of these things are an attack or an undermining of the doctrine of God's omnipotence. It's the almighty God. Now, people have discussed this, actually. Theologians have discussed this. Is it true that is it that God is it's impossible? Say, for example, is it that it's impossible for God to, um, to, to lie, or is it that because God has, has um, declared that there is such such a thing as lying, um, it's impossible for Him to do that? So that is it possible for God to, is it possible for God to, um, create a world where lying is okay? And. I think the answer to that is is no. I think the Bible is saying it's a clear impossibility. These are not these are not possibilities. These are not actualities. These are not things that God wants to do. God's will could never want to lie. It's impossible for God to will Himself to change. He's right. So God is able to do everything that His will desires, and um, God's will never desires anything that is evil or that is wrong. God's will never desires anything that is weak. So the, these impossibilities in God are actually a testimony to his power. Think of it. If God, it's, it's impossible for God to be tempted. How many of us, when we fall into temptation or when we feel temptation hard in an area, feel ourselves, we, we think we're strong? No. Like, when you fall into temptation or if something even tempts you, you don't feel strong. You feel very weak. That's when you realize I'm just a weak person, when you experience temptation. When God says it's impossible for him to be tempted. No, nothing exposes a person's weakness like when they use the word impossible for themselves. It's impossible for me to, I would never do that, they say. If you want to see human frailty at its best, catch someone when they say I would never do and see them at one point in the future when they've done it two million times, right? That, 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 there's nothing that exposes human frailty like that. Our inability to be able to actually say impossible um, for ourselves with any kind of certainty, Right? But God can. God can say whenever he wants. And it's a fact. That's power. It's not weakness. It's power. That means that God can speak this way. So those impossible things in the scripture are God's glory. They're not in any way undermining the power of God. And then another thing to say then as we, as we just draw to a, a close is just a, a word on, 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 on how on another unique way that the Bible testifies to how God demonstrates his power. Interestingly enough, the Bible seems to, and I'm going to read passages, two passages of scripture here. First in 1 Corinthians 1, the Bible seems to indicate, the Bible tells us that one of the ways that God shows humanity, shows the world his power, displays his power, is by using weakness to display his strength. Um, you know, God shows how powerful he is by using weakness. You know, when, when God can use weakness to overcome strength, you, you know that he's, he, he, he's so um, he, he's so powerful. Uh, let me read First Corinthians one because uh, Paul makes that point so uh, quite emphatically there in verse twenty-five. So let me read from verse uh, twenty, actually. No, no, twenty-five. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. 
God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. So God often does that. The passage in Judges 7 um, is a story in, in the book of Judges about God using, choosing to, God, God insists that he would rather use, you know, weakness. He would rather use a small army than a big army. Who, whose story is that? Gideon. Yes, Gideon, Gideon, on, on point. Um, God literally says that, um, Gideon, your, your army is too big for me to use it because then people won't see that this is about my power and I, and I need men not to boast. Human beings, even though they're constantly dependent on God's power, have such a, they're so, um, they're so careless, so forgetful that they start boasting. So very often, God will, he will bring down the powerful by using weakness. Um, as Paul says, the, the weakness of God. God doesn't even have to be strong to outdo the, the strength of men. Now, ultimately, this is very clearly seen in the gospel. In the gospel, God constantly commits himself to using the weak to overcome the strong. You know, the foolishness of God, the foolishness of preaching. God could have, the, the point being, God could have said the way you be saved is by, you know, someone laying hands on you. Um, the way you be saved is by um, fire falling from heaven and that's how you become a Christian. But no, God uses the foolishness of just preaching and proclaiming the gospel. Uh, something as seemingly weak, God uses to um, uh, to, 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 to work such a glorious act as the new birth, the new creation. Um, God could have said, to, to become a Christian, you have to study theology for a certain amount of years and get a degree and master's and so on. No, that's why there's many, uh, there's many people today who study theology and get PhDs but don't know God because the, the power of the gospel is, 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 in, is in what's seemingly weak. The preaching of the gospel. And of course, Jesus Christ on the cross, the Son of God. One of the reasons why the, um, the Jews uh, reject Jesus Christ and reject him as Messiah is just because of how weak he appears to be. He doesn't overcome the Romans as they think he would. He dies on the cross. Um, they, they see this as weakness. But of course, um, on the cross, Jesus Christ was overcoming death and hell itself. Uh, and the cross is the power of God, the scriptures tell us. So, so God is very often uh, showing his power through weakness. Uh, and so very often God defends the weak. He delights in doing that. Um, and, and, and if we're going to be close to the heart of God, we must be those kind of people as well. Let me close then by saying a few things as far as how this ought to affect, um, strengthen our faith and some of the great implications of believing that God is omnipotent. Now, a lot of people call God almighty, for the church especially, when we speak about the power of God, it's, I, I suggest that the primary thing that should come to our minds is the gospel. God puts forth his, this, put forth his power primarily in the preaching of the gospel. It's strange because, you know, for example, the reason why there's, there's, been, there's been big signs and wonders movements over the years, even though for the most part these signs and wonders are very spurious, far and few between, and yet people invest their time and energy in doing them, is because we... We, are, we have ignored and rejected um, what the Bible says is the power of God. That's the preaching of the gospel. And we're looking for something else. And we, we feel like unless we see that, we're not seeing the, the power of God put forth. But no, we must realize this is where God has said he's going to put forth his power is in the proclamation of the gospel, the sharing the good news of Jesus Christ and how that message transforms us. You know, Paul's able to say that the gospel of grace is so powerful that those who believe it will not be under the dominion of sin. Yet Jesus Christ says in another passage in Scripture, those who sin are the slaves of sin, right? It's impossible for man to free himself from the slavery to sin. No one seeks after God. But when the gospel touches a man's heart, he experiences the first signs of freedom from this slave driver, this taskmaster that has enslaved all people. It doesn't matter how great and noble and intelligent and rich people have been, they have all been slaves to sin. Everybody, without fail, regardless of how they were, nurtured, regardless of where they grew up, have been enslaved to sin. 
And only those who experience, the only, the only people who experience freedom from that slave master, who experience liberty from its dominion, are those who believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not those who experience healing, not those who experience miracles. It's the miracle of salvation that comes through the preaching of the gospel. So if the church wants to pre preserve the power of God, it starts by, as it were, being faithful to the gospel, preserving the gospel, proclaiming it, um, living in light of it, uh, not distorting its, its message, uh, and, not, uh, and adorning the gospel. Make sure we, we hold close to the gospel. But the gospel has power. That's what the Bible says. The gospel is the power of God. And so it should also be said that God expects us to experience his power in our lives. And if we're not experiencing the power of God, the power of God's holiness in our lives, we, we, must, we must ask ourselves questions. Why am I not living, experiencing powerful Christianity? Because God promises to put forth his power in the gospel. So the church must, that's, that's where we seek our power. It's in the preaching of the gospel, not in anything else. But also, as you see, right through the scriptures, the power of God is the grounds of the confidence of his people. The reason why we have faith, why we can trust God is because of his power. God has the power to keep us from sin. He has the power to preserve us in a sinful world. He has the power to help us overcome our temptations. Uh, he has the power to supply our needs. So we pray, we pray. Uh, very often our doubting, when we doubt God, when we doubt God's uh, uh, goodness, when we, when we doubt that God can deliver us from certain situations, it's because we are not thinking about how powerful he is. We're thinking so much about the situation. We're thinking so much about the limitation. Uh, but we're not thinking enough about God himself being the omnipotent, almighty. Nothing is too difficult for him. And I, again, as I said, I was uh, doing a Bible study on, uh, on, sorry, I was preaching on Sunday evening from the book of Acts and, and 12 and how God freed um, Peter from prison uh, and, and, and because of his people were praying, the people were praying, the people of God were praying, calling out to God um, and, and God did the, what would have, what seemed impossible, even, even whilst they were praying, they didn't believe it was happening. Um, it seemed impossible to them, but God did the impossible uh, because he's almighty and we, we, we must prove that by prayer though. And so many of us, we don't experience God's power, I'm convinced, because we don't pray enough. So we don't know that God is, we don't know that God is putting, we don't even know when God is doing anything for us, number one. And number two, we don't ask God to do things for us. We, we, we don't know what it's like to actually pray that God will, will save us from situations, open doors for us, give us things. We don't pray. And so you don't pray, you don't know God's power, you don't experience it, you don't taste it, you don't see it in your life, you don't see it in the life of others. Um, uh, and yeah, what, what a, what, in a sense, what a waste to waste omnipotent power, the potential. You talk about wasting potential. There's nothing, there's no, there's, there's, there's no, uh, nothing like wasted potential in a, in a prayerless life. That's what it is to waste potential. To be a Christian who has access to the king of glory, you have free, unrestricted access to him, and you don't use it. Well, that's wasted potential, right? And uh, you cannot, you cannot say to yourself too many times, I need to pray, I need to pray, I need to go back and pray, I need to learn to pray. It's why so much of our lives is riddled with prayerless things, prayerless items, things that have not been prayed over. Who was the king? I think is, uh, is it Hezekiah, who the Bible says when he had a, you know, a king wrote to him a letter, wrote a letter to him, threatening him, he was going to destroy, and the king was far, far more powerful than him. The Bible says he laid the, the letter on the, he laid the letter on the floor and he just prayed over it. He prayed over it. Why so many things in your life are not prayed over is, 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 um, is a strange thing. You have issues with temptation here, but it's not been prayed over. You have issues with your relationships, but it's not been prayed over. You have issues with your finances, not been prayed over. You have issues with your growth and grace, not been prayed over. You have issues with your family, not been prayed over. Think of it, all these things, just not prayed over. And one of the things you're saying is you don't believe that God is almighty, but he really is. He can do all things. So pray and trust in him. Um, and fear him. We must fear God because he's powerful. He's the one we should fear. That's, there's a twofold thing there, actually. One is we should fear God because he can do all things. He, he kills and he gives life. We have to fear God. Um, if he, if God can, he can stop us when he wants. He can judge us when he wants. He's so powerful. But the second thing is we should fear God and not fear men, not fear people. That's what the Bible says. Jesus Christ says, don't fear a man who can only kill the body, which is an amazing thing. You see what Christ is saying? 
The worst thing a person can do to you in this life is kill you. And, yet, and God says, even that is worse, he's not to be feared. He can only kill the body. Jesus Christ says, fair man who can kill, fair God can kill the body and the soul uh, on, on, in judgment. So the whole point is we're not to live our lives for men or by fearing people, trying to, being afraid to, to step on people's toes. I mean, we should be gracious and loving, but being afraid to get, I don't want to get on this person's bad side. I want to be in their good side because they have some connection here or they have some, you know, and so we don't stand up for the truth. Um, because we really don't want this person not to like us, or we don't want to lose favor. We are um, psychophants. We, we, um, uh, we, uh, you know, we, we, we basically seek people's favor. Um, you know, we flatter people. You, people. you could be like that. You're just a, a people pleaser. You know, you, you don't ever want to call, you don't want to stir anything up because you're like, oh, I, I don't want to lose... And you're fearing men, you're fearing people, so we don't tell them the truth, because we're fearing people. We're meant to fear only God, only God we are to fear. Um, and sometimes we, 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 we need to, be, we fear God and so we're brave, and so we say to, that, we say to someone, I don't, I don't appreciate what you did there, or I don't appreciate how you spoke to me there, or that wasn't gracious, that wasn't kind. Um, say no. You know, sometimes you don't say no to people because we're afraid. But we should be afraid only of God. Next time, if you're that kind of person, you're carrying on the fear of people, remind yourself, it's, it's God who's omnipotent. That person is just a man, I promise you. The person is just a woman. It's just a person. It's God who's omnipotent. Um, and it's a terrible thing for Christians in this world to fear, uh, to fear people because eventually it becomes a matter of worship. Who are you going to worship? Um, and last thing is, do not boast then because all power comes from God. God's people are to be humbled by that. Um, and, you know, we live in a world that sometimes can encourage boasting and, and it, can, um, it can promote boasting, reward boasting, but we must not fall into that trap, right? Christians are to be humble people. Everything we have, we have received freely, and believe me, you have. Remember there was a guy who, who boasted in his wealth once. He boasted how much wealth he had made and how he was going to spend it. Now, the rest of his life, enjoying his wealth, he didn't know that the omnipotent God had said, today is the last day you will spend on this earth. Today I require a life from you, right? That's how foolish we are when we boast. Why boast in anything when you don't know, when God can, as soon as he wants, turn it off, right? Why boast in our wealth when God can today decide to turn us bankrupt, when God can require a life from us? Why, why boast in anything? Why boast in our in our beauty, when it's, it's given to us. And um, again, God can today require it from us. So Christians should be humble. And we, we, we are the ones that should have, should learn, should understand the lesson that everything we have, we have received freely from God. And so there's, there's two things in particular there. One, we, 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 don't, uh, we, we don't live to, for the, for the praise of people, trying to earn people's, uh, respect or pe- we want people to notice us. We don't live that way because we're not we're, we're not we're not going to boast. Uh, we, we, and, and secondly, we we, sh- we don't look down on people. You know, don't don't ever become a. We never get to a place in our lives where someone is too inferior for us to relate to, um, because there's nothing to boast in. That's the problem that rich people have, right? They make a certain amount of wealth, they enjoy a certain kind of lifestyle, and a certain demographic of people become beneath them can't relate to them as equals and so on and so forth. That's why the Bible says it's impossible for the rich to get into the kingdom of heaven um, because God's kingdom is made for the lowly. But thank God with all, th- with God all things are possible and we must be careful never to be people who boast. Okay, that's um, a Bible study for tonight. Anyone have any questions before we close? Okay, I'm going to read, I said I was going to answer two questions from, I think it's two, from Bible study last week. Um, so I'm going to do just that and close us in prayer. Um, so this question says, to what extent does God punish for reformation so you can do good in the future like disciplining your child? Versus God punishing for retribution, past behavior. 
to what extent does God punish for reformation versus God punishing for retribution? To what extent? I, I mean, I, I don't know how, to, how you'd answer the extent. I could, I could say he certainly does. It, the extent that would be wrong would be to say that God only does either. So God only ever punishes for retribution. He also punishes for re- re- reformation. That's true. But it's also wrong to say that God only ever punishes for reformation. And that only, God is only ever concerned with how people would be um, in the future. That's, that's, that's untrue. Sometimes God punishes and there's no chance for reformation. Um, so I don't know if, if, it's a, if it's a way to answer the extent. I think if you're saying that, is that, is that, if you're saying that is, is God's punishment always a matter of reforming? No. Sometimes God is not interested in reforming an individual at all. Um, he just wants, it's, it's just about retribution. Um, and then the other one is how important is it for victims to actually see justice being delivered? Assuming justice is being delivered regardless. How important is it for, just, for, for victims to actually see justice being delivered? Of course, it's very important. But the story of the world is that sometimes we won't see justice being delivered. But we call people, Christianity calls people to see justice being delivered by faith. Because very often, you don't see it by sight. Sometimes you do in this present world. You see people facing um, the consequences of their actions and you know, facing justice. Yes, you see that at times. And we praise God for that. We thank God for that when it happens. But very often, many, many times, the wicked go on prospering and you never get to see it. But actually, the amazing thing is that the Bible calls you to see it by faith. That actually, there's a judgment day. So even if you don't see it now, one day you will see it. Uh, there's a day when everyone will answer to, to God. So in that sense, the Christian is a person who can always have consolation in knowing that the judge of the earth will do right. All right. Okay, let me uh, close us in, in prayer tonight. Let us pray. Our blessed God, we thank you for, again, your truth, your word. Thank you for what you reveal to us about yourself. You are the, the powerful God. And we, we confess um, and ask you to forgive us for oh how little we often ponder on these things. You know how how little confidence we 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 place in in this truth. How how prone we are to run to people and depend on people as if they are the the ones who have ultimate power. When you, O oh Lord, are, are alone, the Almighty. So have mercy on us, uh, and and by your Spirit help us to be strengthened in our faith. To, to know that you are the one who has all power. And to, to know that, Lord, you, you put that power forth primarily in delivering men and women from sin and in restoring us into a, a right relationship with you. And may we rejoice in, in, the, in the privilege of knowing Jesus Christ in the gospel. And we pray tonight, oh, Lord, for those who do not know you, anyone who's watching this who might not know you, and we pray that, Lord, your power that delivers men from Satan's bondage and from sin through the gospel will be put forth in their lives. Oh, Lord, that they might receive new hearts, new spirits. Uh, they might be a new creation. This is something that only the uh, mighty, almighty God can do. And we ask for it in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. <laughs>